I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. Welcome to the James Alpatra Show. Today, I am really pleased to have Aaron Brabham co-hosting with me. Aaron, welcome to the show. Man, James, it's an honor. You know, I uh, co-host our sister podcast, Porter Stansberry Show. We had you on at the, I don't know, it's probably maybe the first quarter of last year. We called you the best guest ever. I, and- I remember that. And, and, then, and then you guys actually t- took a train up to New York City to play ping pong with me and you destroyed me at ping pong. Well, look, let me tell you something. Um, you know, I'm a competitive guy. And even though we were really recruiting you to join us, we didn't feel like it would be fair if I just laid down. I do feel bad about that one overhand loop that I had that caught Claudia right between the eyes. And she looked at you like, uh, murder this guy. And unfortunately, I couldn't. Although I think did we have one tie or one close game. I forget. Uh, no, you actually did beat me one game. Uh, good, good. So All right. I, I won the championship, but you did beat me a game, and uh, we'll have plenty more of those, which Excellent. which I'm looking forward to. So, so James, um, tell your listeners about uh, what's burning on your mind at the moment. You know, they always want to know what's inside your head because there's so many things, but what's the one thing you really want them to know about this week? Well, you know, something that I've been thinking about a lot based on the interviews I've done this week and last week, and some of these podcasts have already appeared, some will appear in the coming weeks or months, but there's the whole issue of mastery and what does it take to master something and what does it take to be the best in the world at something? And, you know, we all feel, we all feel that we need two things in our lives. We feel we need to have kind of connection or love with, with people. And we also feel like we want to have a, a sense of achievement. And that achievement could be anything from, you know, minor achievement to, you know, world mastery. And a lot of the guys that I've had, uh, on the show recently have really been masters of their craft. And it's interesting for me to see the similarities between all of them. Like we're, we're you know, we're going to have Elon Schwartz on today. He was, uh, I, I met him because 25 years ago, we were both, you know, very young chess masters moving up in the chess, like the competitive tournament chess world. And, you know, more recently, 
He's, you know, probably one of the best poker players in the world, you know, and he'll describe he's, he's made over seven million in, in poker earnings just in tournaments. Uh, one thing he doesn't say is how much he's made in, um, cash earnings just in informal games. And I can tell you it's quite a bit, but you know, I talked to him. I've talked to other people and the, the common, the commonalities of all of these masters, including what I've experienced in my own different endeavors is very interesting to me. And I, I wrote about that on, on my blog. And uh, I, I think it's going to be a common topic of the show. Yeah. You know, it, it is a, um, it's a great topic. And I know that um, I've had the opportunity to interview Robert Greene. I know you've interviewed Robert Greene. And of course he's written a book about mastery and then you have Malcolm Gladwell with uh, 10,000 hours to become an expert. And it's so difficult for people to figure out what they want to dip their toe into and how deep they want to go into something, because obviously it's an investment of your time, your energy, uh, you know, everything. And, but I, I'll tell you, I think too many people quit way too early without giving it a chance. I think that's right. And I think that's, there's two comments about that. One is, yes, they give up too early when they could have succeeded. And it's part of mastery is not just having a talent. It's not just having a skill. It's not just putting in the time and having the experience, but it's also being able to handle massive, massive failure. So if you're not, if you're willing to kind of take the average career path and there's nothing wrong with that, you're most likely never going to encounter massive you know, almost suicidal failure. But if you're on your own, like let's say you're trying to be champion of the world at tennis or you're, you're doing startups or, you know, you're doing like what Elon did, try to become one of the best in the world at, at poker, you're going to have moments where it's going to feel so bad. You, you will feel that the world would be better off without you. And, you know, getting through those moments is very difficult and they're not very pleasant. So which leads me to the second point. It's okay to quit. It's not that necessary in life. No one demands that you be the best in the world at something that won't necessarily contribute to your overall happiness. And this is a discussion I had with, with Robert Green, who wrote uh, mastery and it's uh, it's on our podcast. It's not always the case that people who are the masters of their craft are the happiest people. Now he brought up Mozart was very happy, but you know, there's plenty of counter examples where you have like from whether it's Napoleon or Bobby Fischer in chess, these were very deeply unhappy people in many cases uh, who were masters of their craft. So, you know, and, and part of the reason they were unhappy is because they devoted so much of their lives to what they wanted to master that they, be, they, they didn't balance it with other things. And I think it's important to have to have that balance. It's important to have love in your life. It's important to know when to relax you know, no, no, nobody in evolution said you need to be a master of something in order to be happy. Like the only thing evolution requires of people is to uh, replicate their DNA. Everything else is kind of a, a side effect of that. Yeah. And James, look, you have a thousand stories. And for some of your new listeners out there that have stumbled across your podcast, they may not know how many times you've uh, questioned, you know, yourself and fought back from the depths of being bankrupt to being lonely, et cetera. But that's for another day. Let's not leave your good friend Elon Schwartz waiting. Let's get him on the phone now. Excellent. I am really excited to be here with my good friend, Elon Schwartz, poker champion, chess master, games master extraordinaire. Elon, welcome to the show. Hi, James. Uh, good to be here. Thanks. Elon, let me first ask you a question. Total career winnings in poker, what are they? Uh, Cash winnings. I, uh, I don't know. Something, uh, I don't know, seven or eight, seven or eight million or something like that. Seven or eight million, uh, cause you need to, you need to start updating your Wikipedia page, which only has you at about five million. So, yeah. Congratulations on, on your success. I've known you literally practically since we were kids playing chess. And going up through the chess world, not the poker world, what were your total career winnings in chess? <laughs> um, maybe 30,000 bucks or something. Not bad for chess, okay? You were, you were a little better than me because um, mine were probably about 4000 or $5,000 in chess uh, playing in the different opens. So Yeah, uh, chess is pretty brutal. 
Why did you? Uh, well, we don't we don't play chess for the for the money though. We play chess for the love. It's totally different. Chess is a love game. Like you, there's kind of a certain excitement. Like uh, you know, you play in Washington Square Park, and there's the whole hustle of it. Like everybody's hustling, and all the NYU students think they're going to be the best in the world at chess because they're so smart. And yet, uh, the chess hustlers win every single game. Yeah, we love the NYU students. What's the actual hustle there? Um. Well, I mean, people think uh, just because they're smart, they could play chess well, and that's not true. You have to study and put years and years of of research into it, and you know, you gotta, you gotta. It, sometimes you put them on the clock, and they're not used to that. Maybe they play okay, but then they they're not used to being on the clock, and then you can gabber at them and tell them they're an idiot a few times, and they get flustered. The kind of things. Uh, you can't really get away with in a poker tournament. You can, you're on the street playing chess. You can get into their head. And, and yet, there must be many different. similarities between chess and poker because yeah. look at all the poker champions who are also chess masters. What it is that you mentioned the years of research, and I can relate to that. I, I've been both a chess player and a poker player, not at your mm -hmm. level in either game, but uh, uh, I can relate to the years of research and study and playing. What's the similarities between chess and poker, and why are so many uh, poker champions also chess masters? Well, both games, uh, I guess, have to deal with memory. A lot of um, you know, memorizing lines in chess and statistics in poker. So strong memory is important. Uh, I think sitting on your duff all day is kind of a cool similarity. We're both both uh, chess players and poker players, I think, ultimately very lazy, and we, we don't really like structure or work. And well, kind of just well let there. me ask you about that, because I've known yeah. you a long time, and as far as I know, you've never had a job. Okay, You didn't finish college. You never had a job. <laughs> what, what do you think... Uh, but, and yet, you're one of the smartest people I know, you know, and you've succeeded massively at everything you've attempted. So, mm -hmm. so what's this is this is almost like the economy that we're moving into, where you can't just sort of like go to college and then go to a cubicle and then get your gold watch at the end. You kind of have to be a hustler in life. And what what do you say are the attributes of a hustler? Because it's not just chess or poker for you; it's everything. Like you played backgammon for money. You've played. You've done lots of gambling for money. Lots of hustling your whole life. What what are elements of the hustler? I think the hustler likes to be tricky. I think the hustler enjoys. Um, living in a fantasy world and kind of tell a lot of lies and, and you can live in the underground and there's a mystery there and it's ethereal and you're, it's magical and people wonder how are these things happening and, and, uh, the, the unknown is, is fascinating, you know, and people sit there and, and, uh, just daydream all day. I think to be a, a good hustler, you, you have to, Kind of, uh, be interested in where energy comes from. I'm telling you, this is some deep <laughs> things. Well, 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 tell me, what are the five elements that, you know, make the good hustler? What have, what have you done to become a good hustler in life? A good hustler. Well, the early and, and, days. And, and you know, that could be like what it took you to get good at poker, what it took you to get good at chess, or, or what kind of psychological mindset in general it takes to be a good hustler. Uh, you have to be pretty hungry. I mean, uh, hunger is important. Like now, I don't have as much hunger anymore. My hustling skills and my will to like crack egos is completely gone. Now I play for different reasons. Before it was like I enjoyed the psychological warfare, and now I play for like more artistic value, something to do. Get up in the in the middle of the night because I I can't sleep. Do you think Do you think your up. ability has gone down since making seven or eight million in, in winnings on poker? Uh, I wouldn't say my ability has gone down, but I say my my hunger is is changed. You know? huh. And and the amount of hours I'm willing to put in is 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 changed. So like, the more volume you you, the more volume you do, the better you should do. So. Well, when, when you were moving up in the chess and poker world, how many hours a day would you say you studied chess and poker, you know, at the different periods uh, of your life? Yeah, it was 
was poker. I guess I played all day. I played and I studied all day and I, you know, read all the books. And chess too. For a while I was doing, I would say, four to five hours a day of chess study. But that was when I was 16 or 17. You know, now I'm four, almost 44. So right, I, well, I, well, but still it's like almost like a full-time job of doing what you're passionate about. Like, ultimately, you wouldn't have pl- done five hours of chess a day if you weren't passionate about it. Yeah. Yeah, I was super into it. That was my love of my, the love of my life. It's the only thing I was ever married to that, uh, that I enjoyed immensely. Right? And how many years Getting were you up. playing poker before you made, you know, before you got into the black with poker, before you got profitable? Um, well, actually, right away. Uh, poker was very easy. I, 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 I honestly, I can say from the very beginning, I, I was a winning player. From, from the, from the moment Fat Nick taught me cards, and Fat Nick was my mentor. He's a street hustler, and, uh, you know, he said if I was gonna make it in this, in this business, I have to learn a lot more games, and he, he had, you know, was an old crackhead, and he thought he had Bell's palsy, he talked out of one side of his face, and he said, E man, if you're going to make money in these games, you're going to have to get this Texas Hold'em under your belt. So he showed me the Texas Hold'em, and we had a little tournament, and like I won right away. We were just playing low stakes, and uh, it came naturally. Maybe it's because my grandpa taught me when I was like four how to play cards. or it just I think so also it was simple. related to your ability. Like after playing, you know, 15 years of chess and backgammon and these other games, I think you understood also the psychology of how to study a game. Because a lot of people ask me, oh, James, I just lost my job. Now I think I'm going to be a professional poker player. I don't know any of these guys who become a success after that. Like there's a certain aspect of being like a killer. And that's what I'm trying to get at. What made you a killer? I don't know. It's because I grew up in New York City and surrounded by 10 million people and you're always on defense in in an environment like that. Maybe it was because, you know, dad left home when I was a little kid and my mom was uh, working in methadone maintenance clinics and I was hanging out in, you know, the South Bronx. Uh, I don't know. It's just... uh, um, uh, I don't know if it's nature or nurture, but I was definitely furious, and I had I needed an outlet, and so poker and chess gave me an avenue to to unleash myself on on everything, and it was uh yeah, it's uh it's I've calmed down and, and learned to understand myself a lot more over the years, and actually it's very helpful to play. These games because if I'm uh, if I'm crazy my results suck and so if I go do yoga and I eat organic food it forces me to to, to lead a cleaner lifestyle also which is good. So so but, so uh, you 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 started playing in kind of like the low stakes games and you made some money but it's a different yeah. world completely when you're playing against the professionals and I know for a fact you were having some hard times before you really kind of made it big, like to the first million in winnings. And I just want to yes. describe like the day before. So, so you came in like third or fourth place in the world series of poker in 2008. Mm-hmm. And the day before you left for the tournament, I remember, you know, just to be totally frank, you were in debt. You were upset. Uh, we had just been at the courts in Brooklyn. I won't say for what reason, but I was the only friend of yours who showed up there. You were in court. You were actually being threatened with jail by the judge, in part because we were joking around in the back and the judge got upset at us. But, uh, but, and then we took a walk and you were saying, James, how can I get my head in shape, you know, to go? I'm leaving for Las Vegas tomorrow. How am I going to get my head in shape? to win this game, to win this tournament. And you went off and you won $3.7 million there. So what did you do after that? How did you get your head into the game? Oh, man. Well, first of all, yeah, you're right. I have gone broke many times in this uh, in this game. Can't, you can't always win. And, um, yes, uh, the life uh, was pretty horrible at that point, to be, to be truthful. I was, like, at, at an all-time low. And I think that's good because I wanted to actually, whenever I get 
this is a pretty bad vicious cycle I'm in, but whenever I'm down, like super down, I try to parallel that experience on the extreme opposite ends. It's uh, been going on for quite a while. So either I'll get really drunk or I'll do something terribly dumb or I will uh, smoke too much, you know, or uh, lose it. And then I have to rebuild myself. And I think that I felt like about the fourth, about probably like the fourth most wretched man in the world. So I went on to become number four in the world championship. I mean, I felt like I should have been the worst guy in the world at that point. I'm surprised I didn't win the whole thing, but sometimes the cards do funny things. Um, yeah, you you were you were great. It was good that you came to court with me. It was a big help. Yeah. Well, but 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 so you're on the plane, to Las Vegas. After that, like, and you, yeah. and I knew you had a lot on your mind. What did you start yeah. thinking to really kind of put that stuff to the side? Like, how did you become? I mean, basically that that started your path towards the seven to eight million in winnings. Was that was like yeah. a turning point for you in your life? Yeah, I think what happened was I was in a coma. Where you got at the tables. I know it's very difficult to uh, win when uh, I'm feeling too emotional. It's like, I don't know, I guess, you know, you trade stock. I guess if you get really emotional about stock or games or chess or poker, it affects your, your results and your, you know, how you think and clarity is all, all gone. Um, and you can't make rational, practical, you know, tactical decisions that make sense. So when I was, uh, completely depressed and I had nothing left in the tank, I could really get in touch with, uh, with calculating and I could see lines and information clearly because I didn't, I just was, I had no fear. Uh, you know, I, I was open minded and everything. Well, what do you mean you had no fear? Like, how did you get rid of the fear? Like, I would have been scared to death. Oh, uh, the fear was gone because I was just, I had, I had hit rock bottom. And I hit rock bottom and I, I really was, I went into a comatose state. And and actually, that summer wasn't the best either. I was, I was playing in these tournaments and I was getting knocked out one after another. I played 15 events that year, I think. And I was the chip leader in a, another tournament, a limit holding tournament with 15 guys left, and I blew up. So blowing up in that tournament, my friends were all standing behind me and they were kind of pissed off because I had a red figure and I dusted off all my chips with like Ace King twice and then Ace Nine and I just went crazy, you know, battling off on, on guys who obviously had something and I, I didn't hit anything. So uh, when the main event came, and I had just, you know, just increased the, the disgusted feeling I had. And and, uh, and then I, at that point, I knew this was the last tournament. Uh, if I didn't do something in this tournament, I was going to go back to Brooklyn and have to be grinding online again. And I just, uh, I went into complete comatose state. And I was uh, uh, probably asleep for the entire tournament. But somehow, I just uh, kept making uh, reasonable decisions. And I suppose I was, the cards were, uh, you know, going my way a little bit for a while. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, so I, oh, being being so down, I, I just uh, actually helped me. It helped, it helped me to, uh, to actually uh, feel terrible. And and you won three point seven million there, but now it sounds yeah. like you've basically doubled that since then. Like, you, have you managed to like stay in that state or know how to get back into that state, or do you think people are intimidated to be at the table with you so that uh, they essentially don't know how to play against you because they know of your reputation? Mm. People tend to play differently against me. Yeah, uh, as far as getting into the zone, it's not something I can do. Uh, some other players who are better than me are probably in the zone more often. Uh, I don't know um, how to turn that on and off, but I get I think familiarity plays a big part in in playing well. You know, just being uh, familiar with the process and focusing on process more than anything else. The results are kind of just going the back burners. I don't even care. You know, I get knocked out of a tournament in five seconds. It doesn't bother me. So it seems like it seems like a doing three or four hours of study a day is important, mm -hmm. whether you're playing chess, 
poker or whatever it is you want to do in life. You have to study the, obviously I know with, with chess and, and with poker, you studied the history of the game. You studied games played by great players. You studied all the statistics. Uh, there's also a psychological component and I'm not talking about going into the comatose state, but I'm sure you have an ability to understand your opponents and that works in chess as well as poker. Can you talk about that a little? Like, how do you recognize the tells? in other people, like when they're, when someone's bluffing, for instance? Uh, the tells. Um, and how well, important is that for poker? When you're, with bluffs, when you're dealing with bluffs, I think lines just don't make sense. Sometimes the amounts people bet don't make sense. They're just tell, trying to tell a story. And because I've seen millions of poker hands, I, I sort of have a feel for what I would do if, if I had a strong hand or... Or what, what just seems to be a logical line, and then people will do something really dumb. Like, for instance, uh, uh, an amateurish play that I see all the time in poker is um, they'll bet kind of a, a lot, like a lot to start, and then maybe a reasonable size bet on the flop, and then they start downsizing. Now the next card comes, and they bet a little bit less, and then on the, on the river, they, they throw in like this hopeless bet where you're definitely going to call, but they're too afraid to bet big because they don't want to lose a chunk of their money. So they bet just a little bit on the end. And and they're hoping you fall. That's why it's amateurish. They, it's very amateurish because they're going to be called all the time because they're laying you sick pot odds. And, you know, they, they're not thinking how, how they can win this pot with, like, a bigger bet, but how they're going to lose less. But you, you've called them on many streets. This is a recurring blunder. It happens all the time with, with with fish. So, so, so you said something very interesting there. You said you've seen millions of hands, and you know what you would do and what you wouldn't do. And mm -hmm. not everybody has the ability. Like, there's a lot of people who play millions of hands and never get any better. So, what mm -hmm. makes what makes the successful player learn from his from his past experiences? And this applies to anything in life, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if you're losing money, you should analyze what you're doing. I mean, you, you know, you, you can't. There's so many stubborn people out of, out, out there that I mean, they they just uh, make the same mistakes and they don't jot anything down or or think that uh, they did anything wrong. Perhaps they chalk it up to fate because uh, you, know, you know, in cards, a lot of people just assume. They're catching bad cards, or they're on a bad run, or, you know. Well, it's interesting. It's like day trading. A lot of people, when they lose money day trading, they always blame it on someone else, or something else, or luck, or whatever. And then, when they are successful at day trading, they think they're a genius. So there's some similarity there. I think, and, and this applies to, to chess or anything, you know, failure is a part of life, and, and you... As opposed to the cubicle life where you rise up in a corporation, there are going to be points where you lose money instead of make money every day, which is an un which is what makes the hustling life different from kind of the normal cubicle corporate life. And I think analyzing failures is critical to success. You can't you can't be successful unless you analyze a thousand failures. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent true. And you I mean, have to be open minded. First, you have to be open minded and understand. Sometimes you're just going to be an idiot, <laughs> and then when you're when things are going well, you have to look at those statistics too, like what's happening, and try to, uh, you know, mm, engage those ideas, and, you know, nurture them, and make make them grow, and try to understand what's really happening. It, it, it's hard. It, it takes a lot of experience, to be, to be honest. I, I mean, as, I, like I said, I was winning from the beginning. But then I went and played better players, and I got crushed uh, for a while. And I didn't understand what was going on at all. And I started reading new books uh, and uh, uh, playing a little lower and gradually increasing, and I uh, started winning in those games. But that took about a year, to be honest. Uh, before a I was year, but you already were... Success. It was like for you picking up a third language. It's as if you had already learned, mastered the skills of picking up a second language and because you were a chess master and now you had to pick up a third language. So you knew some of the, the shortcuts involved. Yeah, yeah. Well, boy, it was unpleasant. Right? It was a rude awakening. I don't know, my ego was completely destroyed. 
I went to the West Coast where they play a much faster style, and I just wasn't used to that run and gun uh, game and things. I got I got run over. So uh, you know, East Coast actually the the games were way softer. So um, in, in what I, way? What do you mean by a faster style? Uh, they just raise, re raise, re raise, or on the West Coast a lot more with a lot um, like with any two cards. And I was used to seeing uh, certain patterns, you know, with people, you know, raise, they generally had something on the East Coast. And, you know, you, you were more patient and you could, you know, pick your spots over there. It was just mayhem. Everybody was raising with anything. There was uh, something in the air in LA or, uh, I don't know what the hell was going on, but, uh, you know, I was, I didn't understand a lot of my, my big parents just lost a ton of value and I had to start playing more. Uh, you know, exotic hands to, to, you know, keep up. And it, the, the pace was so quick. I, I just wasn't used to that. So people just raising me with, with any two cars and turning over all kinds of garbage. And if you run bad for a little while, plus I was stepping up the stakes. So maybe I was a little uncomfortable playing for more. And um, that might have had an effect on me I was unaware of. And, it, it, you know, helped me lose. Uh, I felt uh, I was just uh, lost. So a year is a long time to fail at something every day, particularly when you're losing money. You're losing your life savings. And uh, how do you – and I think that also separates out kind of the person who gives up from the person who becomes the champion. So how do you deal with, like, a year of failure? Like, and again, that's going to be part of life for any kind of – what I call choose yourself life, where you're where you're choosing yourself to succeed, and you're not letting anyone else decide for you what you should do. Failure is a part of that, but how do you fail for a year straight? Uh, well, uh, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. Unfortunately, my sweet my sweet ex wife she had to she had to endure all that <laughs> coming home at four or five in the morning, rip roaring drunk and uh, very depressed, uh, and. Uh, Losing the money, yeah, I, I mean, things were good for a long time, and I was, you know, I'd come home, and I'd lose, you know, a few thousand, and I'd come home and say, oh, baby, it's all going to be good, let's go out to dinner, let's go get a, you know, $400 bottle of wine, and so every, I'll make I'll make the money back tomorrow, and then wake up the next day, and there's another three, four thousand. Uh, yeah, that's terrible. Um, so, so it seems well, like there's a lot of elements here, like... A, there's the three or four or five hours a day of study, which you started around the age of like 16. Um, Mm -hmm. B, there's, you know, kind of finding the right game. Like chess, you know, you can't make money, so you switch to backgammon, you couldn't make money, so you switch to poker, which did make money. So you kind of have to find the game where there's the money. And then there's um, analyzing uh, every single failure, like what, like you have to take every, whether it's a game of chess or a uh, political situation at work or uh, a poker hand or whatever, you kind of have to like break apart. What did I do wrong? And really analyze it. Like it seems more important to analyze the failures than successes. Is that correct? Um, no, I think it's probably, it's probably equivalent. I mean, you should, you should be happy when you're winning. And like you said, I, Enjoy it when you're winning, and 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 you know, look at that too. That's it's important because when you're when you're winning, you're generally happier. So you should think about why you're winning, so that you can stay, uh, you know, elated and you know, feel good about life, and, you know, spread the joy, and, and people can borrow money and stuff like that. <laughs> makes everybody well- makes everybody happier. So, okay, so, so you analyze the, for every single game, you analyze, you know, what happened, you think about it, like you said, you jot down notes, which most poker players or game players I know don't jot down notes, so you uh-huh. probably keep notebooks worth of, you know, full of techniques or tricks or whatever, um, mm-hmm. you know, then, then there's the points when you might go for a year or two years without winning or, or you're trying and it's not really working out and you kind of have to have the psychology to, to stick with that and is there any like one or two uh, psychological tricks you use for yourself to just stick with it or did you just say if I can't do this I'm going to kill myself like well what did you do <laughs> uh, I think it's basically a question of survival it's, it's, 
question of Simeon's survival. I got nothing else to do. I have to do this. What am I going to do? Like, I'm qualified to do nothing. I mean, I got, what am I going to be a waiter? Uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, hang out in the bar, 10 bar. Uh, well, let's, 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 to, let's talk about that. Day. Like, uh, yeah. so you've made, you've made this money. Uh, yeah. what do you do with it now? Like, you obviously don't gamble $7 million in, in poker. Like, what do you do? Uh, h- how do you manage your own money now? And using the kind of money management skills you've learned in poker? Um, well, I opened a wine bar in Brooklyn, which uh, is pretty stable. I mean, people need to get drunk, so that's going, <laughs> that's going well, right? H- how do you uh, manage that? Because I know you live in Austin. Um, my, my best friend from high school and his, um, and his his girl run the bar, so they're awesome, and uh, that that's that's all good. I mean, I've made tons of mistakes with my money. I should have totally invested in like municipal bonds and something safe, or uh, I could have bought Sirius Radio in two thousand and nine for like ten cents a share, but someone talked me out of it. Do you know who that was? <laughs> uh, guilty, guilty as charged. <laughs> So that's like at three or four bucks now, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. You were, you were like begging me, James, don't you think this is a good idea? And I'm like, ah, Elon, I could go bankrupt. Yeah, I think instead you put me in something else called Kushner Lock. That was, <laughs> that was way back. That was like 15 <laughs> years ago. For that, yeah. No, nah, I mean, yeah, that that would have been a nice, a nice hit. Instead, I bought something else. In the stock market... So holding on to money is not something I'm wonderful at. So I have to play. I have to. I have to get back to Vegas. And I have to go to the West Coast. So I am leaving this town. Uh, it seems uh, it's it's kind of I'm kind of a delicate situation here. I got this Irish tornado. This this uh, you know very very hot musician. My first musician. She's wild. Uh, and I have a hard time leaving her. I don't know what I'm going to do. But uh, I have to get back to work. Um, well, when you go back to Las Vegas, do you go mostly in tournaments or in cash games? Um, well, I prefer tournament. I prefer tournament poker, but I will play. I like cash games too. I, but I, I prefer mixed cash games to uh, to no limit cash games. So on the West Coast, they have stud and uh, Omaha high low, other variants of poker that I prefer. So I'll probably do that. And to be fair. You know, I did talk you out of Sirius XM, but I also talked you out of buying a hotel in Brooklyn in 2008. So that would have been a disaster. So I, I'm going to pat myself on the back for that one. Wait a minute. Have you seen the Weiss? The Weiss Hotel in Williams? I mean, these places are doing a killing. Brooklyn's become the new Manhattan. Would All right. So I missed there. there as well. There too. I mean, you talk me every score I come up with. You tell me don't do it. <laughs> so, so for someone... For someone who wants to be like you, wants to be a professional poker player or a professional games player, who, whoever, who knows what's the next game, but what, what should they do? What are the kind of key takeaways they should have? Oh, uh, you gotta have a sense of humor. You gotta, you gotta know you, you, you know, you gotta, I think you just have to love what you do. That basically comes, that's what comes down to. Yeah. But a lot of people but love I, poker and they just don't, they just aren't good at it. So, so yeah. I agree. Po- I, what I loved about poker was the humor that was always around the table, but there's more to it than that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I suppose if you if you like problem solving and you, you know consider yourself to be pretty, you know, you know, clever. Uh, you, you know, I, I don't know. The psychological stuff was was easier for me because I come from New York City. I met all kinds of people. I seen running out with you know billionaires and crackheads. So, I, and I'm, often they were the same person. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, I don't know what it what it what it is. You know, it just um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize a little bit again what what you've said. So there's f- four or five hours of research a day, and how many years of that do you think you need? Oh, um, uh, a couple of years. You know, because there are some really strong poker players who've only been playing a couple of years. So I need to something innate, innate ability. Just some people have it, and some people really just don't have it. Well, a couple of years, true. okay, that starts to get towards the ten thousand hours that you know people like Malcolm Gladwell talk about to become the best mm-hmm. in the world at something. So a, a couple of years yeah. of study, an ability to 
not just kind of blame your failures on someone else. I think blame is, is, is equal to giving up or getting worse. Like you have to be able to analyze your failures and your successes, as you point out. On the yes. long stretches, you have to have a way to kind of keep going. And for you, it was the hunger and the love for it. Uh, and then you also have to have, you know, millions of hands of experience and so not just study. So study is good, but also experience. So, you know, when people are kind of essentially lying to you at the table because they're lying to you to try to get your money. Yeah. Tons of volume. Yeah. I mean, you just have to do tons of volume and to get to the highest levels. That's, that's really what it takes. You know, you got to play, you want to play big against the, against the good players. You have to put in the time. And, and you know, the, again, the reason I wanted to talk to you, Elon, is because the, the best sportsmanship I've ever seen was you going from that day at the court where you were so down and you were afraid to go to jail, and then a few days later, essentially winning $3.7 million. Like, you got yourself in shape, and you were filled with doubt that day. You had to get on a plane the next day. I mean, that, that judge practically wanted to lock up your legs, like with a tracker or whatever. Yeah. And you got on the plane <laughs> and went to Las Vegas and killed it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, freedom is, is a good thing. And when, you, when it's threatened, uh, you know, it's a powerful motivator. So, so what, what's next? Like, what are you, you know, so obviously you're going to play cash games and stuff, but do you want to be playing poker for the rest of your life? What's, what's the next no. thing you're going to do? No, no, no. Uh, that is a good question. That's a tough question. You know, I've been doing it so long, and the sensory overload I experience when I'm playing is so intense. I can't even find that intensity anywhere else. So what do you mean I'm, by sensory overload? Oh, uh, you know, dealing with uh, you know the thousands of people that walk into a tournament hall, uh, hearing the chips, you know, clatter and sounds like crickets, and all the all the jokes and you know. Uh, you know the, the just energy in in a, in a tournament hall. Um, you know, getting up and putting in twelve hours when you sit at those tables. So you're stretching your mind constantly, and then the uh, the way you have to live away from the tables to give yourself the best shot. You know, doing yoga and and you know uh, all the crazy nights. Uh, you know, it's a mix. Like some nights you're doing, you know, sometimes you're doing yoga and you're eating organic fruit, and the next day, you, you know, you're face down in the gutter with a bottle of tequila. And uh, <laughs> how often do you win the day after yoga as opposed to the day after you're you're face down uh, uh, in the gutter? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. If you're living a crappy lifestyle, you're probably not going to do too well. Right. So, 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 so lifestyle, clean lifestyle is added to the list too. Not, not to say there's anything wrong with, with uh, enjoying yourself and, and getting face down in the gutter, but I do think yeah. to be in your, uh, at world champion level, you have to yeah. be, uh, you know, have a r relatively clean physical life, emotional life. Like you can't be in emotional distress all the time yeah. about like a wife or a girlfriend or a spouse. Uh, you probably, you have to be, strong mentally because you're constantly thinking of those millions of hands of experience and you have to be uh do you ever find you have a, a sense of gratitude for for what you've achieved um not really no i i don't even think about it uh that way uh, i don't feel no i don't feel gratitude i don't know what i feel about the whole thing it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> that's good uh, enough I'm so, yeah um Consistency is the the issue with with physical health. If you like, anybody can go and win the World Series of Poker. It happens actually. Some amateurs will come in and do very well, and they you know fat, out of totally out of shape, and a complete mess. Um, but these guys always go broke if they continue playing. Right, and you so, haven't. Like you've basically doubled your winnings since since coming in third or fourth in the World Series of Poker, and so there's some consistent aspect to it. Uh, that shows that it's not just luck or a run of good hands. Yeah, well, I, no, I wouldn't say I doubled my money. I say over the course of the 22 years I've been doing this, that's probably what I've made. But I, I wouldn't say I've doubled money since then. But, you know, I have I, my volume went down significantly. But in the days when I was playing online poker, uh, you know, I would have some pretty good days. But, so what's uh, what's happening with online poker now? What's the story? 
Uh, nothing. I mean, it's available in New Jersey, Delaware, and Las Vegas, and the rest of the states are it's verboten. So we're we're waiting to, to open things back up. And you know, well, where do you play online poker there. right now? Like, how do you do it? Uh, I'm not playing. I, you know, that's the problem. Is it's, it's illegal in Texas, so I, I can't play. I can't play. You can't kind of like spoof an IP address in New Jersey. Yeah, because uh, you know people that do that if they get caught, your funds are just snatched. Yeah, no good. Yeah, so that's no good, right? I mean, you put forth whatever you have on there. You win a big tournament, you got to cash it out right like, immediately. And then there's some problems with cash outs too. So, do you think yeah, it'll gonna... it'll get legal everywhere? Like, are there any poker stocks yeah, that you that you consider think... looking at? Um, well, you know, the Caesars is available, and, they, and I think they made a, a, a different division for their for their online gambling, a different symbol, uh, which I'm not sure I'm not sure what it is, but uh, it's possible that WorldSeriesOfPoker.com will become a beast. But they have to keep out poker stars and full tell. I think that's a big award that's going on right now. Um, the American companies want to maintain or, or you know start to get a share of this online. Beast, which is a billion dollar industry. So, uh, so with, yeah. do people recognize you because you've been because TV poker is so popular? Do people recognize you in the street? Like, hey, you're that poker guy. Not anymore. No, I it's over. Very rarely, your celebrity yeah, status, your, your e list celebrity status is over. Yeah, I guess it kind of, it was nice too. I guess a lot of free drinks back in like 2009, 2010, walking to a bar. And, a lot, you know, a lot of people knew me at that point when I was on TV. You know, I was on TV. Now I'm, I'm old. I'm, 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 I'm old and tired and washed up. You know, I, I got to get my act back together and get back on TV again. It's, it's uh, I, I feel like TV poker is not as popular anymore. Mm, yeah, you're probably right. More, you know, there's tons of TV, tons of people playing. I just came back from Oklahoma, and uh, the the tournament hall was absolutely chock full. It was it was jam packed, and 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 they're doing crazy numbers all over the place. In fact, I think Vegas had, uh, for the first time in years, had uh, winning numbers in Vegas, uh, big big numbers, big profits in Vegas for the, all their poker rooms. Oh, really? Because because yeah. typically the poker room is not a big source of profit for casinos because it's not like you're gambling against the casino; you're gambling against each other. They just get paid by the hour, basically, or they get paid by the by the hand. Yeah, that's right. But the, tab the more tables are full, so maybe the TV thing is going, is dying down because more people are just out playing. And then so it was kind of a novelty in the beginning. You see people hold cards, and it was kind of interesting. And now so many people are playing, they're not at home watching. I, I want to talk about one other thing, which is a, a mutual friend of ours uh, who, uh, literally, when I met him, he was homeless and he was playing chess for like fifty cents a game. And then he like disappeared for six months and suddenly he had made like a million dollars playing backgammon, which is falafel. Um, you know, yeah. so, so people, we all called him falafel. And uh -huh. what happened, what happened to him? Like, how did he become the best player in backgammon in a few months and then made so much money? Um, uh, well, I mean, obviously he's uh, some kind of genius, right? He speaks three languages. Yeah, but he was you not know. that great at chess. I mean, I mean, he was good, good enough to no, also no, watch his for a part, no. but not, not like top level. Well, if you ask Falafel, and called him Falafel because that's all he could afford to eat every day, he told me he studied a ton. That, that's what he said. He, he sat with the computer and he just memorized everything and, and, uh, you know, he, he jotted down all his mistakes, the same things we're talking about, but he was, Super into it, and and it was his passion and joy. As soon as he found backgammon, he was playing every single day. So you put, I mean, it's the love of his life, and he worked harder than everybody, and he had natural ability. So, so natural ability again. That four or five hours of study, love what you mm -hmm. do, and he played all day. And then, literally, I'm not even joking. Within six months, he, he probably built up a bankroll of about seven, eight hundred thousand dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Like, yeah, I mean, and that guy was good. broke. Like, he'd wake up on the grass in Washington Square Park and start playing yeah, homeless. chess. Homeless. Homeless. He was yeah. homeless. He was actually living in the park. This guy was playing for 50 cents a game. He went on to become essentially the world champion. 
I think he's still the world champion at backgammon, or the, one of the best top five rating, in the world. Yeah, he's the highest rated. Yeah, he plays the best. Like uh, according to uh, computer rating, he makes the least amount of mistakes. Huh, interesting. That's so fascinating. All right, well, yeah. Elon Schwartz, I'm really glad you were able to join me on my show here. We've known each other for a long time. We've played chess, backgammon, poker, every possible game together. So, and you know, and more. So, uh, some stuff we even have to not say on this broadcast. But uh, but it's been great having you here, and uh, I hope you you win your next twenty tournaments. All right, James. Thanks. Uh, Let me know when you're next back in New York, and we'll we'll check out your uh, wine bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll call you when I when I come home. We'll hang out. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Elon. All right. All right. Bye, James. All right, James. Excellent interview with Elon Schwartz. Thanks, Aaron. That was a lot of fun. You know, Elon and I, we go way back. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff in between the lines there on that interview. Unfortunately, because not not every story is meant to be told. Yeah, I I, I got to tell you, man, if there was like a premium version of your podcast that I could pay for where you could reveal those stories that you were alluding to, you could have my money right now. But I have a feeling it's not worth any price that you guys could name. No, you know, one time I actually did write something about Elon in the Financial Times, and it was a little bit revealing. And he was actually in the offices of a fashion company Look that wanted that that were he they were thinking of paying him to sponsor you know wearing their clothes while he was on TV you know winning in poker tournaments and right when he was in that meeting the guy was reading the Financial Times and said whoa we can't we can't sponsor you Elon and Elon actually he didn't mention this in the interview he stopped talking to me for like two years and uh, it took a while to kind of rebuild the 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 friendship uh, but I'm glad we did. Okay, some things are better left unsaid. We'll leave it at that. So, so James, I, I know you did a great job of giving a summary for kind of what the listeners could get out of it. But what was the one or two things that really um, stood out or surprised you about the interview? Well, you know, I thought, like, I, I've known him for a long time, so maybe Elon doesn't know this about himself. But Elon and guys like him, people who have essentially hustled their entire lives, they don't realize that when compared to people in, you know, other areas of life, they're, they're real hardcore killers. Like when you sit across the poker table or the chess table or the backgammon table, uh, from, from Elon, he's not just playing a game with you. He will rip your throat out and eat your heart and then laugh and eat the rest of you. Like he will just slice you up and kill you and have no qualms about it. So what I really kind of, you know, was curious to see is how much he would confess to that. But he might not even know that about himself just because it's so much a part of his daily existence. Like when when I'm playing him in chess and again, we're both, you know, almost the same ranked, but he's he's consistently been a little better than me. Uh, he when I'm sitting across the table from him, I'm totally aware on every move he is trying to. Just obliterate me, not just win a game. He is trying to obliterate my personality and, and that's how he wins. And that's what happens in poker too. When you watch him, you know, there's many episodes of kind of world series of poker where, where Elon's winning and you see he's, he's out thinking his opponent. There's another thing that's very interesting. One time, uh, we were talking about one of the hands, uh, in that particular world series where he won 3.7 million. And, you know, I don't know if I ever told you this, Aaron, but I played professional poker for uh, a while in the 90s. This was before it was a, a fashionable TV thing. Yeah, before but, it was a TV sport. <laughs> yeah, before it was a TV sport. So there was like underground clubs that I would go to here and then I would go to Atlantic City. I'd go to Las Vegas. All cash games, no no tournaments. It wasn't worth it to play in tournaments. And But anyway, Elon was describing a couple of hands to me and he was – and I understand the language and I could, and I understand that the language of the killer as well, but he was going so deep into his analysis. It was really blowing me away how many things he was looking at in a, in a poker game. And so sometimes people ask me like, Oh, I just lost my job. Should I go and learn uh, poker and play online poker? And I think to myself, no way, man, you should not play online poker because you're up against the, the killers of the world and better to stay away from people who want to kill you. And I'm not saying stay away from Elon. I'm only talking metaphorically, but 
don't don't swim in the water with sharks because these guys are sharks and they will kill you. And that's what it takes to be, you know, to hustle for, for 25 years. He's Elon's never held, held a job in his life. That's what it takes to, to be like that. Yeah, a couple of things that really stood out to me that I kept kind of kind of resonating in my head was this, you know, he's a poker player, but it was this education component, right? So, you know, you've written a blog post about uh, how you have to learn uh, Scrabble, to become a Scrabble master, then you can start to become a, a poker master, a chess master, a right. backgammon, because you have to understand the basic concepts. One thing that really stood out was he kind of had this quick rise where he made imme- immediate money. And a lot of times that can be a detriment. But then when he started playing better players, he started getting annihilated. So what did he do? Re- reverted back to four to five hours a day of studying, reading books, becoming a master of his craft and getting back in the trenches. And I think a lot of your listeners can relate to that, especially what you talked about at the beginning of the show where you said, look, it's about mastery and believing in yourself and not giving up and all those things. You're going to hit these peaks and you're going to kind of hit these plateaus. You have to push through those things in order to uh, kind of get near the summit. Wouldn't you agree? Totally. You, you, you totally have to push through them. Like imagine as an example, uh, you, you know Spanish. Let's even say you grew up in Spain. And so now you go to France and you think, oh, this is going to be easy because it's a Latin language. It's right next to Spain. I'm going to pick up the language easy. And you get, you get in Paris and suddenly everyone's making fun of you because that's what they do in Paris if you don't speak French. So, uh, you could either, you know, hide and go back to Spain or you can learn the skills that you have of learning a language and learn French. And that's what poker was for, for Elon. And that's what many endeavors are. You know, we, we don't, none of us in life just do one thing our whole lives. So if you want to be good at more than one thing, it's almost like learning a third language where you, 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 you know what it takes to learn that first language or the second language. You have to, you, you have to understand what, what are the techniques? What are the basic grammar rules of language? And now you can learn your third language. It'll be a much faster process, but you still have to go through the process. And that's what Elon had to do uh, to get good at poker, or else he would just be like everyone else who says, "Ah, oh, yeah, poker is a luck game," when it really isn't. It's it's a it's it was his third language, where chess and backgammon were like his first languages. Yeah, one more thing uh, that I'd like to to get your opinion on and and kind of your thoughts on before we go to the uh, Ask Altucher segment, which is the mailbag, is um, his he mentioned a daily practice very, very briefly. And I'm not even sure if he technically has a daily practice like you do, but he mentioned eating well and sleeping well. That's when he's at the top of his game. And uh, isn't that kind of what all like anyone that's looking to achieve a higher level of success don't you need to have these really good daily practice habits absolutely because for instance if you're sick let's just take a basic example if you're sick you're not going to be at the top of your game if you're having a a fight with your spouse you're not going to be at the top of your game if you're not you know, if you're always blaming other people for your problems and you're not grateful for the, uh, you know, the sheer abundance we have in life around us, you're not going to be at the top of your game. So always making sure every day. And for me, it's, you know, I call the daily practices, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual health. For me, if I don't check the box on all four of those things, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be at my peak performance. And the goal is not necessarily peak performance every day, but the goal is to kind of have a, a calm life, a peaceful life, a happy life, so that then when I do, when I am, uh, attacked by the monsters around me, I can fight back. I don't, I don't fold up and, and, and die. I can, I can be creative. I can be energetic and I can succeed. And that's really the key to success for, for everybody. You'll find in every interview I do, uh, everybody's got their own form of, of daily practice. You know, and we have, we have somebody coming up in the next few weeks who talked about how he deals with anxiety, how he uses, uh, play, even something as simple as, you know, playing catch with, with another business partner. Uh, you know, things like that help reduce anxiety, help you get at the top of your game, help you stay fit and remain healthy. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And one more thing. I know I said I'd go straight to your Ask Altitude segment, but something just triggered in my mind. You know, when most people hear professional poker, 
Uh, the last thing these guys are doing is gambling. These guys know when to um, cut their losses. They know which hands to play. And you've read about this. It's tragically boring. If you want to sit inside with a bunch of gross dudes, as you've stated, for 12 hours and maybe play three or four hands, that's great. Um, but what I'm trying to say is this is not gambling. Most people think of poker as gambling no, this is about like having a PhD and understanding when to cut your losses, not when to just randomly throw your money out, hoping to rock the one armed bandit to win a Mercedes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, poker is an extremely difficult game. Like, as I mentioned, when, when Elon was analyzing one of his hands for me at one point, um, he went down very deep, like examining all the statistics of the hand, the odds of the hand. Uh, the odds that he was going to succeed in having the best hand. And then also, based on his experience playing the other players, what were the odds that they had the hands they were claiming to have? And you claim to have a hand by the way you bet. So, in, in a sense, what were the odds that they were bluffing or not based on his memory of, you know, prior experiences he's had with how they play? So, there is a lot of skill involved in playing a, a game like poker very well. Just as much as, as chess or backgammon, you know, we talked a little bit in that interview about a friend of ours, Falafel, who statistically is the number one player in the world right now at backgammon. And that is a hard skill. Like I play backgammon as well. And it is hard to be the best in the world at, at any of these types of games. That's right. At anything. And, you know, uh, coming from, you know, the, the show that I co-host with Porter, you know, we, we get all kinds of feedback about amateur traders, you know, and they just throw all their money into some penny stock that they heard their neighbor talk about. Uh, you know, don't do that. Just like don't go enter a poker tournament thinking you're just going to get lucky. You're going to get smoked by a bunch of stone cold assassins, like you said. I mean, I remember the first two times I played uh, poker at one of these underground clubs in, in New York City, and I brought like a thousand bucks with me each time. I think it took about and, you know, and the bets were small. Uh, but I think it took about 10 minutes in each case for me to lose my thousand dollars. And it took a while for me to be consistently break even and then a while longer to be a money making player. And that's, and that's me, like who I already had mastered chess and backgammon and Scrabble actually and was moving into poker. So, so I bought every bulk I, I actually sent away for videos because it wasn't on TV at the time. And I probably spent a good like four or five hours a day studying before I would go and play all night long at these clubs. And then finally I became, you know, consistently profitable. But it's, it's, it's very difficult. You can't, nobody's entitled to, to, to win money at anything. It, it all takes hard work. And, and look, day trading is the topic of another podcast. Yeah, we'll save that point. for another topic. But, but sure. we'll have, we'll have a fun time because I made a living for a while as a, for a long time as a professional day trader. So that was a, a whole other story. Yeah, we'll save that for another podcast. All right, James, let's jump into the mailbag. It's to ask out that you're part of the show. You've received tons of feedback, just fantastic feedback and some really challenging questions. I've chosen three. And I don't want you to dwell on it for too long, but uh, let me fire these at you and get your take. Uh, email one says, uh, how do I tell my parents I'm dropping out of college? Well, there's really two answers to that. One is uh, your parents don't own you. I mean, they've, they've, you know, they've outlawed slavery, uh, for one thing, <laughs> a long time ago in the United States and, and longer in other parts of the world. So your parents don't own you and you're an adult. Uh, so you should really you know, feel comfortable knowing that as an adult, if your parents are going to respect you for the next 40 or 50 years or 60 years of your life, they need to have conversations where you're honest with them. It's not your, it's not necessarily your problem if they're angry with you. You don't have to control their emotions. So, so that's one answer. You kind of have to just take care of yourself first. It's, a, it's the same answer as, you know, why does the, uh, parent have to put on their own oxygen mask first before the baby when the plane is going down it's because you have to protect yourself first and in order for the other people around you to be safe. So first you have to do what your heart is telling you. And this particular person obviously wants to drop out of college, has good reasons for it probably. And, you know, you just tell them, I'm doing it. I'm an adult. You'll be uh, you know, we'll see what happens, but I'm counting on the fact that you'll be proud of me later. And if we're going to have a relationship for the rest of our lives as, as individual adults, then 
this will be good news for you. I had to tell my parents, for instance, when I left uh, graduate school, and they were extremely disappointed, but life goes on. Uh, the other answer to that is nobody should even be going to college. Like college is, you know, nobody can yet give me a good reason why they should go to college. Oh, you make connections. Listen, it doesn't cost $200,000 to make connections. I can tell you 40 other ways to make connections. Oh, you learn the liberal arts. You learn history. My answer, go to the library and for free, you can learn history. Uh, oh, well, you learn how to be, it's sort of a transition into being an adult. Oh, yeah, I will tell, whether you're a man or a woman, I know exactly what you're doing those four years of college. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't cost $200,000 to do that. So student loan debt is at its highest levels ever. It's completely a scam. You're wasting four or five years of your life uh, when you could be either starting businesses or learning a lot more by untraditional methods. So nobody should be going to college in the first place. And we'll, we could talk more about that on another podcast. Yeah, most certainly. All right, let's go to uh, the second Ask, Ask Altucher. How do you start over after failing with no money, broken relationships, and a mountain of debt? I don't even know if this is possible to answer. Well, I mean, if you have absolutely no money at all, then it's very difficult. You, you're in a homeless shelter then. But, you know, most people have essentially some situation that they're in. Like maybe they have uh, – maybe they're broke – uh, uh, they have no, they, they have a lot of debt and they have minimal income or minimal savings left. The very first thing to do again is take care of yourself, is to find your own daily practice. So I've been in that situation where I've been totally broke. I lost my home. I was getting a divorce. I had no money. I had no connections. And really I had no friends at the time. So I had to take a step back and not try to make friends or jobs or opportunities from a moment of anxiety, but I had to, I had to find my own inner core first. And I did that by physically getting in shape, uh, sleeping well, eating well, stopping alcohol. I had to emotionally get in shape. So I had to stop being around people who would, uh, put me down or who were negative. So I, I started to spend time only with people who I really loved and respected and who respected me. I had to mentally get in shape. For me, that meant, uh, writing down at least 10 to 20 ideas a day, like business ideas or trading ideas or book ideas or whatever. So I had to get my mind in shape and spiritually I had to get in shape. I had to learn that despite everything bad that was happening to me, I couldn't really blame anyone and I couldn't waste time on regret. I had to be grateful for what I had. So at the time I had two beautiful children I was grateful for and I had a life and I was fairly healthy and 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 so on. So I was very grateful for what I did have. And that's from that point, you'll start the ideas will start, you know, I'm snapping my fingers, the ideas will start clicking and, and popping in your head, particularly after you do this for a few months. It's not overnight. You do this for a few months. And I, I can say from that point in time, my life has been completely different every six months, without a doubt, completely different and always better. So it's been a really good practice for me. Yeah, the uh, daily practice will definitely get you to change your habits and start you out differently. Uh, the last one I have, and then we'll wrap the show up, is how do I choose between a startup and a job? Well, you know, it depends what your situation is, of course. But always consider your a job is not permanent. Not, neither is a startup. But uh, in a startup, you're building equity for yourself. You're creating something where not only are you making money, but the thing you're creating is also increasing in value and you're getting you're getting economic value from from that. When you have a job, all you're doing is getting an income and you're also getting some experience, but you're getting an income, but you're creating value for somebody else. So a couple things there. One is, you know, you're getting paid less than the value you're bringing. So otherwise, that company would go out of business because they have to pay people less than the value that they're bringing in or else there's no point in them hiring you. So already your true value has been, let's say, cut in half or, you know, cut by 20, 20 to 50 percent. Then you have to pay full taxes. OK, when you do a startup, there's capital gains taxes. But when you're making an income, you're paying full income taxes. So that's another 40 percent hit to your income on top of the 50 percent of value that you're bringing to the business. Then you're paying all these things like you know, extra costs for health care, you're supporting whatever uh, poor infrastructure the business might have, depending on the business. 
you know, if you are going to take a job, very important is to take a very prof, a, a job at a very profitable company, because then, you know, at least your, your, the value you're bringing is not going into paying for their, uh, very poor margins and poor infrastructure. So in general, you know, that's a rough answer, but in general, you're losing, you're leaving a lot of money on the table when you take a job as opposed to doing your own startup. And so that's why I always recommend either become a lifestyle entrepreneur where it's your one man business or join a startup where there's chance for more, you know, equity in the business or do your own startup where, you know, you, you come up with an idea and start your own business. Yeah, that's great. All right. Well, James, that wraps up your show for today. You've certainly given your listeners a lot to think about. Uh, thank you for listening to the James Altucher Show on Stansbury Radio. And a special thanks to Elon Schwartz for joining us today. I have the privilege in knowing who your future guests are coming up for probably the next six or seven shows. I'm astonished at the names that you're able to pull in to do this, uh, to do these interviews with. And I know our listeners will be excited to hear from them. Uh, one thing that really helps out is because you're a newer show on iTunes. Anyone that really is enjoying the show, if they could go on there and, and give a rating and even a review, uh, you know, good, bad, whatever you want. But if you're enjoying it, pass the word along because that's uh, really what we're kind of relying on. Right, James? Absolutely. You know, uh, I'm really grateful for the people who have been listening to it on iTunes and leaving reviews. And this has been a great experience just the past, you know, month or so since we started it. All right, James. Well, that's the show. Uh, have a great week, and we'll talk to you, you guys too, next Aaron. week. All right, take care. Stansberry Radio is a purely public broadcast and is not intended to be personalized financial advice for any individual specific situation. Each individual's financial situation is unique and Stansberry Radio should not be relied upon and or considered as personalized advice. Stansberry Radio is not licensed to render personalized advice and should be considered simply the public opinions of Stansberry Radio and its guests. Recommendations on specific financial securities are not intended to address any listener's particular financial situation. Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. Or the Allison Devon, founder of Teespressa. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash black and unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash black and unlimited.